So we got a couple of comments on our History of LEGO Racers 3 video that claimed LEGO Racers 2 ruined the franchise. I wanted to take a minute to dive into why many people might think that, but why I personally don't. A little bit of history before we dive in. LEGO Racers, originally released in 1999, was developed by Illinois-based game developers High Voltage Software. Now, while fans may look back fondly on the first Racers game, its critical reception was less than ideal. I was shocked during my research for this script to find that sites like IGN gave the PC version of LEGO Racers a 6.1 out of 10, with the N64 port taking home a barely better 7.5. GameSpot gave the game's PC and N64 versions a 7 and a 4.6, respectively. And before you're all, hey, 7 is a perfectly respectable score, I agree. Anything over a 7 is good in my book, but it's that 6.1 and 4.6 that surprised me. The same kind of surprise I felt when, in the year of our lord 2021, I discovered that all the guys from DC Talk sang back up on the 2000 Michael McDonald cover of the famous Marvin Gaye song, Ain't That Peculiar. But regardless of the critical reception of LEGO Racers, it must have sold well because the LEGO group did, in fact, decide to pursue the development of a sequel, and the torch for LEGO Racers development was passed to British video game studio Attention to Detail. Attention to Detail released LEGO Racers 2 in 2001 and a spiritual successor to LEGO Racers in 2002. Attention to Detail was developing a follow-up Racers title shortly after, but due to the studio's closure in mid-2003, nothing was ever seen from that potential racers game. If you want to learn more about this, check out our History of LEGO Racers 3 video. But did LEGO Racers 2 ruin the franchise? Well, the critics, at least, found it to be marginally better than its predecessor, with IGN surpassing LEGO Racers 6.1 to give LEGO Racers 2 a 7.8 out of 10. But you're not here to know what other critics think, you've come to this video to know what I think. And as unwise a decision you've made to put stock in my opinion of this near two decade old title, let's dive into it. LEGO Racers 2 was a vastly more ambitious project than LEGO Racers. While the original Flavor Racers game was a very simple arcade kart racer, Racers 2 had open worlds, deeper character and car customization, and a more pronounced narrative. It is without a doubt a wildly different game than the first LEGO Racers, and I think that's probably the crux of why certain people don't like it. If you don't buy into the narrative or the open world gameplay, you won't enjoy Racers 2 as much as the first title regardless of what improvements it may or may not have made on the franchise as a whole. HowLongToBeat.com lists the main story completion time of LEGO Racers at 4 hours, but having recently played through every circuit for our 2020 Extra Life charity stream, I know for a fact that you can get through every circuit race in little over an hour and a half. I don't know if it includes time trials or whatnot in the quote main story stat, but 4 hours seems generous. HowLongToBeat.com lists LEGO Racers 2 main story as 3.5 hours, which may seem to fly in the face of my claim that Racers 2 is more ambitious than Racers 1, but allow me to explain. Within LEGO Racers 2's overworld environments are a number of gold bricks that you will need to collect in order to unlock and progress through the game's collection of environments. You can also earn gold bricks by beating the tracks of each world, but eventually you'll need to go exploring to find enough bricks to progress. When you look at the completion times of each Racers game, you'll see that Racers 2's 17.5 hour completion time dwarfs Racers 1's 7.5. Now I wanted to start with this discussion of completion times to give you an idea of the breadth of content we'll be discussing. While Racers 1 was really just a racing game with single track races, circuits, and time trials, LEGO Racers 2 has a career mode, free roam, time trials, and mini games. Let's dive into the game's career mode first. This is where the meat of LEGO Racers 2 exists. In the game's opening cutscene, we view a dejected rocket racer stumble through a beach town, fresh off his defeat at the end of LEGO Racers. The sea breeze picks up a flurry of trash, and upon these warming winds is a leaflet highlighting his defeat. 
While gazing at this manifestation of his failure, another paper flutters down the road and straight into his face. Upon pulling the discarded fragment away from his eyes, he sees that it is an advertisement for the planet Zalix, a world dedicated to racing. With newfound resolve, he departs to Zalix and rises up the leaderboards. Your journey begins once word of Rocket Racer's new status as Galactic Racing Champion arrives back on the sun-kissed shores of Sandy Bay. Your story begins more or less in the opening menus of LEGO Racers 2, as Sparky, your guide through the worlds of LR2, helps you through character and car customization. And while these moments may feel familiar to those who played LEGO Racers 1, LEGO Racers 2 immediately sets itself apart from its predecessor the moment you actually launch into the game. Your first moments in Sandy Bay are open world, as Sparky teaches you the ins and outs of automobile operation. After you build your car and take it for a spin around Sandy Bay, you'll find yourself amongst a collection of the town's most blue-collar citizens, who are arguing amongst themselves about who would win in a race around town. Workman Fred brags to his cohorts about his new digger, which he claims makes him the fastest racer in Sandy Bay. A claim that, if true, would surely result in the violation of a number of OSHA guidelines. Uh, Brian David Gilbert, DM me if this is true. Fireman Gavin, Mike the Postman, and Police Chief Bobby all refute this claim, instead challenging Fred to beat you, the player, in a race. Fred is so confident in the speed of his digger that he wagers a gold brick against his chances at victory, thus establishing the importance of gold bricks to the narrative of LEGO Racers 2. And so the gauntlet is laid down, and off we go to the construction site to challenge the hubris of Workman Fred. Apart from severe user error, you should beat Fred with ease. I mean, who ever heard of a digger winning a race? I actually wrote that part of the script before I went and captured gameplay, and I was actually quite surprised at how many tries it took me to first beat Workman Fred. I don't know if it was a product of having not played the game in almost a decade or that I had to use a, a third-party PS2 controller, but it was not easy. From this point on, you'll work your way through all of Sandy Bay's public employees, gathering gold bricks both as spoils of victory and as you travel to and from each race. You'll have the opportunity to complete a few mini-games to earn further stat bonuses for your car before heading off to the next world, the Adventurer's Zone. Unlike Sandy Bay, the Adventurer's World has a hub from which you can choose to participate in individual races or explore the open world of the ancient island. This is the format for all following game worlds, until you finally earn enough gold bricks and defeat enough boss challengers to earn a ticket to the faraway Zalix. But before we get there, you'll have to visit Mars and the Arctic and beat their bosses. I do also have a note here that the cutscene that leads you into the Mars area is wild, almost like it was meant for an entirely different game. You crash land somewhat spectacularly onto the Martian surface, and your wreckage is discovered by a giant alien mech, which will serve as the final boss for this world. I also had a physical set of the shuttle that takes you to Mars, and it was awesome. It like came apart in bits and you could rearrange and it was really cool. But without much to speak of by way of robust narrative development in the adventurer's Martian or Arctic worlds, you'll soon find yourself on the alien world of Zalix. Zalix is far and away the best environment in LEGO Racers 2, for reasons we'll dig into in a bit. And once you battle your way through all of Zalix's underlings, you'll be able to compete once again against Rocket Racer, and claim for yourself the title of Galactic Racing Champion. So with that summation of LEGO Racers 2 Adventure Mode out of the way, let's break down, if you'll allow me a pun, the building blocks of LEGO Racers 2. As we've already touched on in a couple of places, LEGO Racers 2's open world is perhaps its most defining feature within the greater canon of LEGO racing games. And if some of the comments on Subpixel videos are any indication, one of the more contentious points for fans of the series. Many have questioned what prompted attention to detail to discard the arcade racing style of the first game in favor of an open world narrative-driven racing title. 
And while it may seem like a completely out of left field development decision from our comfy gamer chairs here in 2021, it makes a lot of sense when you look at the landscape of racing games in the early 2000s. The fifth and sixth best selling PlayStation 2 games in 2000, a year prior to the release of LEGO Racers 2, were Ridge Racer 5 and Midnight Club Street Racing. While Ridge Racer is more traditionally arcadey like the original LEGO Racers, Midnight Club bears marked aesthetic and gameplay similarities to LEGO Racers 2, and I wouldn't be surprised to learn if Rockstar's racing title inspired some of the design and systems ATD would put into LEGO Racers 2. And in the years after the launch of LEGO Racers 2, the market has seen more and more narrative-driven open-world racing games and fewer and fewer arcade racers. Now you as a consumer may not like that market trend, but there's no denying that attention to detail had their finger on the pulse of where racing games were headed. LEGO Racers 2's open-world environments allow for organic learning of the play spaces. By the time you actually free roam each level, you'll know where everything is because you've already raced by it. Now, I will say that on occasion, the organic rally race type tracks in LEGO Racers 2 did cause me some confusion as to where I was actually supposed to go, even when prompted by the game's obnoxiously large guiding arrow. However, the fluid layout of each track also allows for some clever driving between waypoints, allowing players to create their own shortcuts through the tracks whenever possible. In this regard, LEGO Racers 2's individual tracks feel far less curated or designed than the tracks in Racers 1, but when considered holistically within each world of LEGO Racers 2, are delightfully well thought out. There are, however, some odd decisions made in regards to the track flavor text dialogue of some of the characters. For instance, in the first race of the Adventure Zone, Sparky remarks that we should be careful driving across the rope bridge because they don't think it's very stable. This would lead one to believe that perhaps the track has some kind of dynamic evolution to it, like the Desert Adventure Dragway in classic LEGO racers, and that perhaps once enough people have crossed the bridge, the bridge will collapse and racers will have to find a new way across the ravine for the final lap, but as it turns out, Sparky's remark is only flavor text. The bridge never collapses. The open world also provides for dynamic traffic hazards, at least in the Adventurers and Mars worlds. Adventurers has dinos that wander in and out of active racetracks, Mars has giant alien mechs, and though the Arctic doesn't have any wandering obstacles, you will have to worry about cracks in the ice that will send you plummeting into the ocean, forcing a hard rebuild of your car. Now I feel like I need to put a section about the individual tracks here, even though there really isn't much to speak of until you get to Zalix. From Sandy Bay to the Arctic, all the tracks are just different routes through each overworld, as we've said. There are a palette of region types that you'll become familiar with, like at least one section in each world where you'll have to choose between two paths, or a big foresty section of many branching routes, allowing for an obvious shared design language between each world of LEGO Racers 2. Amidst this homogeneity, there are some interesting bits here and there, like driving alongside a T-Rex in the Adventurer's Forest or driving through an icebreaker in the Arctic, but Zalix is really where attention to details level designers get their chance to shine. Zalix is the closest LEGO Racers 2 comes to the original flavor of LEGO Racers. Part of this is necessitated by the lore of Zalix itself, that the whole racing environment is built into a dome a la some fancy Olympic sporting event, so there's not really an overworld to explore, but also because of how each track is designed. No more do LEGO Racers 2's tracks just wend their way through one exotic locale or another. Now they twist and turn up huge loops and towering curves. One incredibly short figure 8 track provides some of the most fun vehicular mayhem in the whole game. However, all this wonderful Zalix track design slams itself face down into the ground once you finally challenge Rocket Racer for the title of Galactic Racing Champion. I distinctly remember this moment from when I first played this game as a kid. 
I just battled my way through some of the most fun, inventive tracks in the whole game, and knowing how wild Rocket Racer's track was in Classic LEGO Racers, I couldn't wait to see what attention to detail had in store. A loading bar eked its way across the screen, and suddenly there I was, side by side with Rocket Racer on a... circle. That was it. The final track. A circle with some obstacles scattered throughout it. This bit puzzled me then and has continued to puzzle me even into adulthood. After all this crazy track design, a circle is the route of the final confrontation with the big bad? Was this a budget thing? Had attention to detail run out of time? Was it publisher interference? There were a few other clues throughout this most recent playthrough that lead me to believe that perhaps it was just attention to detail running out of time, but that's pure speculation. We'll talk about some of those other reasons later. The car customization in LEGO Racers 2 is light years ahead of what players were capable of in classic LEGO Racers. There are a greater selection of chassis, parts, and unique pieces for the player to make their ultimate racer, if one of the game's myriad prefab vehicles doesn't suit your fancy. I will say though, car customization on console is far more difficult than it was on PC, so I mostly just used the prefab cars during this playthrough of LEGO Racers 2. A very cool addition to LEGO Racers 2 that was actually originally planned by High Voltage to be a function in LEGO Racers Classic but ended up left on the cutting room floor is the destructibility of yours and your opponent's cars. If you take damage either from the environment, an opponent, an opponent's item, you'll lose some bricks off your car. Lose enough bricks and you'll have to run around the track on foot until you can reach a specific pit area that will rebuild your car and restore lost bricks. And you can't use items while on foot, making the race that much more tense if you ever find yourself without a vehicle. And before we move on to the, the bad bits of the game, I wanted to take a brief moment to talk about one of the really fun parts of LEGO Racers 2, the action replay. When you complete a race, you'll have a couple of options of what to do next. One of these is Action Replay. Action Replay is, as the name suggests, a replay of the race you just completed, as preset cameras move through pre-programmed repeating camera moves to show you interesting new angles of your path to victory. Now, while this may not seem like much from our perspective here in 2021, when we have things like Mario Kart 8 and its highlight reels, which are stunningly cinematic, take a moment to consider that LEGO Racers 2 had implemented a similar system in 2001. I recalled these action replays being super cool when I was a kid, but now that I'm an adult and one with a filmmaking background, these action replays are super cool. I mean, just look at this jib shot. It's obvious that someone at attention to detail understood both good shot composition and camera movement. Though the action replay often switches from sweeping wide angles to extreme close-ups and POV perspectives, whatever racer is the subject of the shot is always at the center of the frame, meaning the viewer's eye doesn't have to dart across the screen to pick up the racer every time the shot changes. This philosophy of cinematography obviously directly inspired Australia's foremost authority on automotive cinema, George Miller. However, as I continued playing through the game and watching the action replays, they got less and less interesting, or were subject to more and more obvious problems, like following the subject of the shot for several seconds after the subject has passed out of view. The camera moves were also less dynamic than on Sandy Bay, which was disappointing. I wanted to see some of those spectacular crane and jib shots on Zalex, but it was all either locked off panning and tilting shots or POV shots from the cars. So LEGO Racers 2 has a lot of good going for it. But now that I'm nearly two decades removed from my original playthrough, I can see that there's also a lot of bad mixed in there. Though bad may also be the wrong word, maybe misguided. I don't know, you, you be the judge here. I will temper this section with a quote from former Attention to Detail programmer Simon Goodwin, which I, I know I've used in other videos about LEGO games, but we'll use it again here since we're finally talking about the game for which this quote was originally spoken. 
the management of LEGO games seldom lasted as long as it took to complete a console title, and drew from a pool of people with little experience in the games industry, which meant frustrating changes in direction that did not improve the eventual product. So let's talk about the mini games. So each boss of Rocket Racer will give you a modification for your car, and you can earn additional bonuses for those modifications by completing mini games throughout each open world. All of these mini games boil down to go here, collect this, bring it back. On Sandy Bay, it's a crazy taxi style game where you take passengers around the island. Everywhere else, you'll be collecting some resource or another and returning it to one specific place on the overworld. Since functionally every minigame is the same regardless of which zone you're in, once you've played one, you've played them all. You can also inexplicably enter minigames during a race which doesn't prompt you asking if you'd like to leave the race and participate in the minigame, it just hard loads you into the minigame. Now this won't happen often, but given the slipperiness of LEGO Racers 2's controls, it can happen more easily than you think. And like I mentioned a second ago, these minigames allow you to incrementally enhance your car's stats, which won't matter much until you finally reach Rocket Racer, who is completely unbeatable if you reach him with your base automotive attributes, forcing you to return to these mundane exercises in item retrieval if you actually want to complete the game. And speaking of items, the item selection really feels like a grab bag of nonsense. Nothing makes particular sense to be included, and each item's use seems hyper-specific to certain, not often encountered situations. With the exception of one item that smashes bricks off every character's car, everything is best gotten rid of immediately after acquisition, regardless of if you're near other racers or not. Now, one of the more useful items, at least when amongst a group of racers, is the explosion power-up. Symbolized by a storm cloud and a bolt of lightning, the explosion takes a few seconds to power up after activating, but eventually blasts a dome of energy out from your car, affecting other nearby characters. There are several projectile items, including a homing missile drill and a throwbot's throwing disc. The disc functions almost exactly as a green shell in Mario Kart, bouncing off geometry until it hits a racer or runs out of power. In the early Sandy Bay levels and the eventual boss levels, when you're only racing one other racer at a time, the disc is practically useless. Though once you get familiar with the speed of the disc, you can do some pretty spectacular sniping of your enemies. All in all, I much prefer the tacticality of original LEGO Racer's item system. This is by far the worst aspect of the game. Your cars are so slippery. Good luck making any sort of tight turn at high speed. The power slide from LEGO Racers 1 is a distant memory. If you hit the brakes during a slide, you'll just stop. And if you keep accelerating through a hard turn, you'll probably spin out. If you try to turn immediately after making a jump, you'll probably spin out. If you look at your car the wrong way, you'll probably spin out. Original LEGO Racer's controls are almost too tight by comparison, especially after playing more modern racing games. I'd often find myself taking turns in LEGO Racer's too close and snagging my car on the edge of the level geometry. LEGO Racer's 2 does not have that problem. Or it, it does, but not in the same manner. LEGO Racer's 2 is an exercise in pain management. You will spin out. That cannot be avoided. And when you spin out, it will take more time than you expect to course correct, especially if your new trajectory caused you to miss a checkpoint. Throwing your car in reverse is awkwardly slow, and sometimes you cannot just force yourself off whatever obstacle you've collided into. If you watch the action replay, you'll notice that even the AI loses control of these cars. Now all in all, I did enjoy this little revisit to LEGO Racers 2, but it's clear to me, with rose-tinted glasses lifted more than a decade after my inaugural playthrough, that LEGO Racers 2 is not as perfect as I once imagined. The obvious departures from LEGO Racers 1 are all the more apparent now than they were back then, and all the more confusing though a little more understandable in the context of Simon Goodwin's analysis of how the LEGO group managed their various contracted development studios back in the day. 
So what do you think about the LEGO Racers franchise? Which, which game is your favorite? When was the last time you played it? Let us know down in the comments. As always, I've been Jake Terrio. This has been Subpixel Spotlight, and we'll see you next time. Hey everybody, this is uh, Jake Terrio with Subpixel. Um, Will says I can't come back to the studio unless you like and subscribe. And if you leave a comment, he even says he'll give me a warm uh, blanket. So uh, please do that, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you in the next video.